Okay, welcome everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. You are hearing Joe and Michelle, and I will kick us off with some introductions as we say thank you for joining us. So Joel Folkman is our co-founder and president here at Zenger Folkman. He is globally recognized as a top leader in the field of psychometrics, leadership, and change. He is a consultant to some of the world's most successful organizations, a best-selling author, a frequent keynote speaker, and a conference presenter. I am Michelle Fabian, and I am the VP of Facilitation and Coaching Solutions here at Zenger Folkman. And I am a newer employee to being officially part of Zenger Folkman, but my history with them goes back about 13 years where I was on the client side and had the opportunity to roll out Extraordinary Leader in my organization and a chance to facilitate and coach within that organization. And our third person with us today is Tracy Consolini. She is a regional vice president here today. And while Joe and I are doing the talking, she's going to manage the chat for us. So feel free to drop your questions into the chat and Tracy will answer them. And or if it needs to go to somebody else, we will take care of that after our session today. So again, welcome, everybody. Happy to have you here. For those of you who may not know who we are and may have stumbled into joining us today, welcome. And let me tell you a little bit about who we are and what we offer. We specialize in leadership development. Our founders are legends in the industry and built Zenger Folkman with the mission to bring science to the art of leadership. Our Extraordinary Leader 360 is award-winning and globally recognized as one of the best and most effective feedback tools in the industry. We've been perfecting our assessments and development experiences for the past 19 years to ensure that we stay current with the needs of the leaders of the organizations today. Our research is published in some of the most respected publications, such as Harvard Business Review, the New York Times, and Wall Street Journal. We are dedicated to helping leaders discover and build their strengths and to become extraordinary. Today, we're excited to give you a brief introduction to Zenger Folkman's flagship offering, The Extraordinary Leader. Now I'll hand it over to Joe to get us started. Uh, Michelle, it's a delight to be here with you. Uh, I think uh, you you hold the record for for having put uh, uh, just thousands of people through leadership development using our materials. So we were glad that uh, when Michelle was available, we could uh, twist her arm and get her to join us. Uh, last week, I was with a, a, a group of uh, medical doctors uh, at Yale University and giving a speech. I started off by asking this question, have you ever worked for a terrible leader? <laughs> and I was surprised how many hands went up. It's like, whoa, yes. And the first question is, what was it like? And typically they say it was horrible. It was terrible. I hated my job, blah, blah, blah. And, I, I, and then I asked this question. I said, now, uh, were you the only one that believed this leader was terrible? And they said, oh, no, everybody knew. Everybody knew. And I said, everybody? Did did the leader themselves know that they were a terrible leader? And they said, no, <laughs> they didn't have a clue. And that is that is an interesting artifact, if you will, of our business it turns out that the worst person at understanding how effective you are as a leader is you. <laughs> Other people are really clear. Now, to demonstrate that, I want to show you this study where we looked at your ability to predict your strengths and weaknesses. This is using 360 degree feedback. And what we're showing you here is something, a little statistic we call an R squared, which is about the uh, percent of variance accounted for. But basically it's a way to tell how accurate you are at predicting things. And what we found when we looked at this data, and this is over a hundred thousand people in this study, we found that, that the, the person themselves looking at their ratings on their effectiveness, they were only half as accurate at predicting the strengths and weaknesses than any other raider. Other raiders were twice as accurate. So here's this interesting fact, and 
we capitalized on that by saying, you know, if we could help people understand their strengths and weaknesses, if we could help people understand how effective they are, that's the first step in helping them to improve. Now, as we've gathered data, we found that this assessment that we've created, this 360 assessment, is the most accurate and precise measure of leadership effectiveness that we know of. Uh, what I'm showing you here is the correlation between leadership effectiveness as measured by this 360 assessment. And we divided that leadership effectiveness measure into 20 different groupings here. Uh, the worst leaders at the fifth percentile and the best leaders at the hundredth percentile. And the bars represent employee engagement. Now, here's what we found. If you work for a terrible boss, your engagement is about the 21st percentile. What's interesting is if we swap out the worst boss for a pretty good boss, one at the 50th percentile, and everything else stays the same, your pay, your job, your work, everything else. But if we just swap bosses, what we find is fairly quickly engagement will go up to the 48th percentile. And then if we swap out that boss for a great boss, engagement goes to the 85th percentile. And of course, engagement is a great way to understand how much people love their job and they're, they love their work and they're willing to give more effort. So it's a really interesting outcome. But what we found is with this 360, we could predict other things. So several years ago, we were working with a mortgage broker they thought they had a great strategy to, to really take over. We gathered 360 feedback from the mortgage office leaders, and then we had a P&L for each office. What we found is the worst leaders actually lost money. <laughs> it was a great strategy, but somebody messed it up. But the good leaders, those in the middle 80%, they made 2.4 million in profit. But look at the best leaders they doubled the amount of net income and they got about 4.5. So extraordinary leaders make a real big difference. And one of the classic things we like to suggest when we're developing leaders is we ask the question, does your organization need good leaders? I asked a group last week, I said, do you need good leaders? And they all said, yes. And I said, I disagree. <laughs> And here's why. Good leaders only get you halfway there. What you need is great leaders. So Michelle, how do you become a great leader? Yeah, that's a great question. So what, what is that big key message, right? So today's workforce wants to work for an excellent leader. So think about the stories Joe just shared with us and getting to excellent and people aren't working for excellent leaders today. So simply put, better leaders equal better results. Those numbers we just saw. Third, it leads us into that space of having accurate assessments provides us as leaders an opportunity to gain self-awareness. Many leaders have no insight into whether they're the worst or the best. That first slide we saw around self-perception. So we need that self-awareness in order to help us be extraordinary and to be excellent. So we at Zanger Folkman have a proven process to help us to do that, to move from ordinary and from great all the way to extraordinary. And so when I, when I first saw this slide, it reminded me of one of my coaching clients who she herself wanted to excel. She wanted to move up in the organization and to advance. And yet she didn't know how she was doing. She suspected she was doing well, but she wanted to verify that and to have information to help move her in a, a higher position within the organization. So she had the opportunity to go through Extraordinary Leader and she received her feedback and she had some great scores, mostly focused on getting things done. <laughs> so she was getting the results piece of it. And while she was a good people leader, her people weren't saying she was an excellent people leader. So over the next few months, I had the opportunity to coach her, to engage with her and to help her put a plan together to move towards that becoming more extraordinary based on her self-awareness. So Joe, if you'll go to the next slide, we'll look at what does the process look like for this? How do we make that happen? So we choose 
the right process, in this case, Zenger Folkman, and the opportunity to get feedback through a multi-rater assessment, and that's our valid and predictive assessment, which then leads us to a strength building approach. So we focus in on the things we're doing well and move from great to extraordinary. It's sometimes for many of us, a new development approach to changing our behavior. It's a shift from thinking, oh, I need to move from average to good or average to great all the way over to extraordinary. And you heard me say part of how she accomplished that was through coaching support and follow up with me and her peers, those around her that she was tapping into in order to support her development and of course her manager as well. So Joe, why don't you tell us a little bit more about Zenger Folkman's approach? Well, we had collected just thousands and thousands of pieces of data. And as I looked at all this data, I got interested in, and and I've created these surveys. We had over 2000 survey items in our database. And the question I started to ask was, well, which of these items is the best item? And so we designed a test to measure that. And the test was, we identified the worst leaders, those at the bottom 10%, and the best leaders, those at the top 10%. And what we looked at with the individual behaviors is which behaviors showed the biggest difference between the best and the worst. We, we called these differentiating items, right? And as we went through and tested all these 2,000 items, we found fairly consistently that some items were a lot better than others. In fact, some items weren't good at all. My favorite one there was, is on time to meetings. Turns out really good leaders are sometimes late. Really bad leaders are sometimes early. <laughs> that didn't differentiate, but there were these, uh, these ones that really did differentiate. And the more we looked at the data, we saw consistency between these differentiating items. And ultimately, they clustered into these 19 differentiating competencies. And these are the 19 competencies. And what they are are the behaviors that are the best at separating great leaders from poor leaders. Now, here's the good news about these 19 differentiating competencies. When you do one of them well, people really notice. They they can see it. It's wow, it stands out like a, I mean, it it really is noticeable. And oh, by the way, if you don't do it well, it crushes your effectiveness. So we're going to talk about those two dimensions, but this is how we measure people. We give them this feedback. And what it does is give you a lot of opportunities as you think about how could I improve. These are the things that matter the most. These are the, the competencies that if you move one, it's really noticeable and it makes a huge change in how you're perceived as a leader. So Michelle, tell us a little bit about our approach here. Yeah, we like to break this into what we call insights. And one of our big insights, if you think back to the tent poles we just saw, is to get where you want to go, we need to know where we are today. And so by having an opportunity to participate in the multi-rater assessment, we are given that opportunity to know. It's like having a GPS with no destination, right? We need those 19 competencies to put in, which one do I wanna to head towards, but where do I wanna go? Which one would be most helpful? So let us, let's take a peek at what the report looks like, just to give you one page within the entire report. This is an example of what it looks like to see those 19 competencies and whether or not we have a profound strength, which is indicated by that green bar, or you can see the breakdown there of the potential other ones. We're seeing mostly the green and the blue here on this slide, but we break it down by profound, promising, above average, below average, and potential fatal flaw. So we're working towards those profound strengths in that, that top quartile. And sometimes, as Joe just mentioned, if we have spaces where we're in trouble and it's impacting us, we might see it as a yellow bar called potential fatal flaws. And where do you think our eyes want to go? Joe, were you going to inject something? Well, I was just going to confess that, that you know, right after Michelle showed up here, we said, Michelle, we're going to do our, our twice, you know, we do about every other year, our 360 survey again. <laughs> Congratulations. You yeah. come just in time. So yeah. you just got your report. And I got my report. Boy, wow, that was fun, wasn't it, Michelle? Yeah. <laughs> 
Yes. <laughs> Got some sur surprises. And, and what's interesting is, is, you know, Michelle's amazing and it showed up in her report and I'm just okay, but that's good too. <laughs> Not at all true, everyone. Don't believe Joe. <laughs> and so for sometimes our eyes go right to that lowest score. And because we generally, right, think about this question real quick for yourself. For most people, performance improvement means dot, dot, dot. Most of us say fixing weaknesses and our approach is no, we do not believe unless it is that potential fatal flaw. And we find that out through getting the opportunity to get some feedback from other people around us. Because what did we say early on in this session? That our self-perception isn't great <laughs> and we generally don't see ourselves the way other people see us. So our research shows that building on our strengths is where we want to focus our development. So let's look at the next slide, Joe. And what does it mean to move towards having some of those strengths? And, and Michelle, I just wanted to yeah. mention that 80% of the time, ah, yes. we've looked at the data, 80% of the time, people are better off focusing on their strengths mm -hmm. and working on our weaknesses. But 20% of the time, people have... Well, they they're really killed. They're they're they sticking at something. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, something's getting in the way of us being able to see that eighty percent stuff they might have of showing if they could get rid of the twenty percent, the one thing that isn't working for them. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, great call out, Jill. So here's what we know. Here's what our data tells us: having three profound strengths puts us at that 81st percentile or in the top 20% of leaders within our database. And by the time we have five profound strengths, and remember we're talking out of 19 in our standard assessment, by the time we have five, we're in the top 10% of leaders in the database. Now notice that if we start from the space of zero, we're at the 34th percentile. So we, if we start there, we have room to grow. And by the time we reach three to five, we will be seen into that extraordinary. So what this tells us is, if we peek at the next slide, good news, I say wipe my brow is what I would always say when I would facilitate this, is you don't have to be perfect. We get to focus in on our strengths. So we don't have to have the goal of all 19, three to five based on what we saw in the previous data. This is another one of the insights that we like to share and might also require some unlearning for some of us who might be perfectionists. And I, I might be a work in progress from that perspective and doing the work of Zenger Folkman has helped me greatly over the years to let go of this idea that I have to be excellent at everything and really focus in on those handful of things that will make a difference for me and for the people that I'm working with. Remember that leader I mentioned earlier that I had the opportunity to work with? She also wanted to go right for those lower or mid-range scores. And I had to keep lift the eyes back up, lift the eyes back up, and let's focus in on what your strengths are. Joe, share with us some more about why strength building is so important. When uh, we first approached people about building strengths, um, you know, we were kind of excited about that. We thought it was a great idea, but it's interesting. Let's say that you got some feedback and you had a significant weakness in displaying integrity and honesty. So if we ask people, well, what would you do to improve? Uh, people usually come up with some what we call linear suggestions for improvement, such as, well, stop lying. <laughs> that helped. How about quit cheating? Okay, walk your talk. In other words, what people look for are these weaknesses. And, and it's true. If you identify those weaknesses and if you quit lying and quit cheating and, and uh, walk your talk, your performance will improve. So for the most part, people know how to fix a weakness. They know what to do. It's, it's what we call linear development. What was interesting when we brought this idea about building strengths forward, a lot of people said, well, okay, so wonder if I was pretty good at displaying integrity, honesty, how would I go from good to great? <laughs> well, when we asked them or when we asked them to, to brainstorm it, they came up with, we'll just be really honest or really, really honest or be honest harder. And what that does is it, it really doesn't help. I mean, it, there's nothing to do there. People just said, just do it more. 
do the same thing more. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that's the definition of insanity, doing the same, same thing, thing and expecting different results. Yes. So we discovered as we looked at the data that what we know how to do is fix weaknesses, but what we don't know how to do was to build strengths. Mm -hmm. Now, in our research, we discovered that there were other behaviors that helped you to be good at a particular behavior, right? And so we used a little AI kind of technique here where we had thousands and thousands of leaders. We dove into the data and we said, look, if you were good at displaying integrity and honesty, were there other behaviors that really helped you to be great? And we called these strength builders Michelle, give us an example of one of the strength builders here. Yeah, I love that introduction into strength builders. And thank you for creating those because, yes, telling people to just be more honest was not always beneficial <laughs> in coaching <laughs> conversations. So what does here's our displays high integrity and honesty. And one of those, you can see five blue circles here around it. We're going to look at one first. So Joe, pop that one in. And we see be assertive. So one of those strength builder behaviors that we can use, and we like to call this a non-linear approach. Also, sometimes think about it at cross-training. Those of you that maybe run or participate in one main activity and you move over to cross-training, think of this as cross-training as well. So being assertive. So ask yourself the question right now while you're listening to me fill in as well. Why would being assertive demonstrate to people that we're displaying high integrity and honesty? It's an interesting question to ponder initially. And maybe some of you are thinking what I thought the first time I saw it, which is, oh, well, how does anybody know if I have integrity and honesty if I don't speak up and share the things that are important to me or take a stance if I disagree with something that is happening in the moment? So it's having a point of view. And by sharing that point of view, people then see and give me even more credit because remember, we're working on a strength. So if I already have integrity and honesty and then I'm assertive on top of that, I'm displaying even more so for people that I want to be well known for having honesty and integrity. So, Joe, let's fill in the rest of them for him just for those who might be curious of what are the additional strength builders that go with displays high integrity and honesty. So we have this for each of our 19 competencies where they will have strength builders that go along with them. The numbers do vary a little. They aren't all five, but roughly in that range of, of strength builders. And if you go forward one more slide for me, Joe, let's show them what it looks like within the development guide itself. So there's that, I like to call it a wheel or a circle again. We're getting to see a little peek at a different one here with displays or develop strategic perspective. And then we have accompanying pages that go along with each of those strength builders. A little bit of a why. Why is that one a connection? Some might make sense to us and we read them and go, oh yeah, I get it. And some we might need a little more insight from that data and research. And then we also get development ideas. So to steal what Joe said a moment ago, the, the AI, right? We're trying to be a little AI before AI was AI <laughs> and saying, let us let us offer you up some development ideas to get you thinking about how you might implement some of these strength builders. And one last peek at the next slide for the development plan. So we ultimately take all of those elements, the report, the feedback, hopefully a coaching conversation. We pick a competency, a, a strength builder, and we then draft a development plan. Every leader will select that competency and a strength builder and create a plan that looks somewhat like the sample that we're seeing here. So it's a great opportunity to make feedback actionable. Joe, why don't you share with us some data on leaders who increase their effectiveness and how this is beneficial to them? I will. And, and Michelle, you know, if you like this idea of nonlinear development and, and this approach, there's only one one firm in the world that has this, that uses this, and that's at Singer Folkman. Mm -hmm. uh, we we really have a unique ask, uh, approach here, and we're the only firm that really has done this research. We think we know this approach really helps people to improve. And so, uh, you know, this is the show me the money, Joe, <laughs> kind of slide. 
Uh, what we find is, is the majority of leaders who uh, go through this development process, getting 360 feedback, identifying 20% of the time a, a fatal flaw, but 80% of the time a strength to build, uh, and then creating a development plan. And then we come back in 18 to 24 months and reassess them. So this is the results of 3,050 people who went through the process. Uh, and these are the people that improved. Now, for those with a fatal flaw, right, there's something terribly wrong. In their pretest data, they were at the 18th percentile. And in 18 to 24 months, they moved from the 18th percentile, they, they were bad, to the 46th percentile. They, they moved from, I'm a bad leader, to I'm okay. I mean, I, you know, I'm doing okay. That is a significant improvement. In fact, it's larger than the strength builders. But if you look at the people who built strengths, they there was nothing terribly wrong with them. So they come in right just slightly below average at the 55th percentile. But 18 to 24 months later, they moved to the 75th percentile. You know, when when you uh, do an employee engagement survey and you look at the issues that people care about, the, the things that, that people really want, of course, number one is more pay. <laughs> but what's number two or three? It is people want to develop. Mm -hmm. They want to grow. They, wanna, they don't want to just be a pair of hands. They want to grow and they want to learn and they want to develop. And there's no better skill to teach them than leadership. Leadership has a profound effect on every aspect of our lives. We think we've developed a great approach to developing leaders. Now, my partner, Jack Zinger, would say that, that when you think about the cost of leadership development, and a lot of people say, well, it's expensive. You know what's really costs a lot of money? Bad leaders. <laughs> because people don't quit organizations, they quit their boss. And so what we've found is, is that, that by improving leadership effectiveness, we can improve uh, and decrease the amount of turnover there is. We can improve customer satisfaction by 40%. And discretionary effort, which is the percentage of people willing to go the extra mile. When you think about the outcomes and how that increases profitability, the costs of leadership development are nothing. I mean, really, because you increase outcomes, this is free. So Jack Zanger, my partner, he made this uh, comment in a recent blog. Leadership should be treated as a genuine profesh profession, demanding ongoing education and skill refinement. Just as lawyers and doctors continually update their expertise, leaders must proactively improve. I oftentimes talk about 360 and people say, well, I, I did one of those. And I said, well, when did you do that? Oh, about 10 years ago. <laughs> Has anything in your life changed in the last 10 years? Everything. I think it's time. It's time for you to do another one. It's time for people to get that feedback. I know the process takes some time. It takes some commitment but it is the most significant development process we know of, and it creates more opportunities for change than any other. Now, we have a lot of confidence in our process. We think that we can make, take good leaders and make them great. And if you'd like to uh, participate in this, we'd invite you to uh, attend a virtual Extraordinary Leader Development Experience. If you'll contact us, we can give you some special, a special offer there we've got waiting for you. Uh, visit our website, and at our website, you'll find a lot of information, research, blogs, podcasts, and these webinars all on our website. So uh, we'd love some feedback from you on this, on this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, Michelle and I are both anxious to, to get your feedback. So please jump on this uh, exit survey, if you would, 
leave some comments, ask us some hard questions. Uh, I'll let Michelle Ar answer the hard ones and I'll do the easy ones. <laughs> yeah. but, but show us uh, the, and, and, and this is a great thing. And if you, if you, the survey doesn't automatically come up, you can go to this bit.ly link, all in lowercase here, bit.ly, Z-F-E-L preview. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you for joining me. Thank Have a you great for having day. Me. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. bye.